Hello everyone, my name is Robert Pratton and uh, I create adventures and in fact our um, mission for the company is to make everyone's life an adventure and uh, the way that we do that is by creating participatory experiences and these experiences blend the digital world and the real world so you might call them mixed reality uh, experiences and the mindset needed for this is we treat the world as a storytelling canvas so we, do, we don't limit our stories to a particular screen or to a book and this is what's uh, meant often by transmedia storytelling so we tell stories across uh, multiple platforms so as a company um, we have a technology we establish ourselves to create this technology and it's called conductor because like the conductor of an orchestra it orchestrates the user experience as they move across different platforms so the platform learns about the learner or the uh, consumer or the you know the participant the player and it tries to adapt and keep making an experience more and more personable uh, personalized to them so to main, maintain their engagement that's the that's the key thing so i'm going to give uh, an example of something that we did last year and this was for um, Canal Plus which is a broadcaster in Spain and this was an experience that we created for uh, the Game of Thrones <laughs> So um, this experience was like fantastic, fantastically uh, successful. So uh, normally uh, positive sort of brand sentiment uh, increases from these types of things are measured in single digits. So the fact that we got 42% was like, you know, unheard of really. And uh, what you're seeing here is a live experience with 240 people uh, from the Facebook uh, page that were invited to take part um, in the shooting of the commercial for the upcoming series. This was an actor, this is our actor that we'd scripted. And what he's doing is he's calling them to war. He's saying that, you know, war's coming and you will have to choose a side, like one of the great families from the Game of Thrones, and you have to fight for a territory. And from this live experience, when people left, they were given a scroll and it said, if you see this character, he's, um, <clears throat> he's a wanted man and you should report him. So people were encouraged to email in and tell their stories about this uh, particular character. And then we shifted from real world to online and we had a massively multiplayer role playing game on Twitter. <clears throat> so using Twitter, um, you could, um, of course, you could fight people you could attack them but you could also seduce them you could uh, make friends with them and then betray them and um, what would happen um, midweek is that you could go into uh, certain retail outlets like the the Spanish equivalent of uh, Smith's and you would see a story um, on, a, on sort of designated sort of pillars and it might say something like uh, here lies a merchant that's been attacked by bandits and you look around his body and you find five gold coins or two bronze coins and with that came a code you put that code into your phone and it unlocked virtual currency that you could then spend on potions and shields and so on 
And this uh, ran out over 10 weeks while the TV series was on. And at the end, we had um, a live performance in the centre of Madrid, and the winner of the game uh, was flown from the Balearic Islands to be crowned the King of the Andals and the First Men. And uh, the timing was pretty good on this because two weeks earlier, the real King of Spain had abdicated. So that was quite a nice uh, PR boost uh, for us. <laughs> So what I've shown in this is the way that a story has been told across lots of platforms, across Twitter. In the video there you saw that there was Facebook engagement where we, every week we invited people to take part in the story, to invent their own weapon one week, you know, how much would it cost, you know, what's the sort of uh, attack strength of it. Another time was take a photograph, you know, with um, our logo in the local sort of uh, place and so on. But we also uh, tell these stories across other sort of more serious things. So this is um, an experience that's intended for students aged about 14 to 17. It says above 12 here. And uh, they role play being executives of a space cargo company. And what happens at the start of this experience is one of their rocket ships crashes into a local village and they have to um, decide what they're going to do about that. And each of the students is given a role, so they might be CEO, the CFO and so on, and different stakeholders around this event come in to give their opinion. They might be on social media or they might be through this web app. So we'll have someone from the union, someone that's an environmental activist and so on. We have a client in Brazil that uses our technology for recruitment and what they've done is they've created um, a business um, world. But what it is, it's a business game about a business that's going bust and the participants have to decide, they have to collaborate and decide how it's going to sort of solve itself. And what's nice about this is they say people lie on their CV but let's see how they perform in a real situation. So. Um, we've got different stories that test for innovation or results orientation and as this story runs out it takes about two hours there are moderators and observers that are looking for different behaviors so on their console it will say uh, the participants have just learned that Gennaro is embezzling funds and then we look to see how these different and they sort of check off different behaviors that they're expecting so it's much more accurate than just a CV and we're currently uh, doing a project with the Ministry of Defence. So war stories are really important for as a learning kind of tool, things that went well, things that didn't go so well, particularly like uh, cultural stories about the way, say if uh, there were troops engaged in Afghanistan, and because we don't all use the same cultural hand signals, certain things didn't go off quite so well as they could have. Um, and so what we're doing actually is building an instructor dashboard to monitor and assess um, uh, servicemen and women as they go through training, both field exercise and sort of individual tasks. And where we're going with this is to create like an adaptive training system. So to take that personalization that we've done in entertainment and these other things and apply it more directly to this type of training. So to look at stories, I think the key thing, and Dal touched on it in his talk, is that they really work on the imagination. So in this, if we were to break down this, I could tell you that there was a cardboard box with a hole cut out of it and a kid inside. But we're trying to piece together that. What we see is a rocket. We see somebody going on an adventure because our minds are not happy with these kind of disparate pieces of information. We don't handle randomness very well. And so we always try to connect things into a, into a story. So just read this. What's powerful about this story is what's not on the screen. So our imagination is reading in the white space. And so good stories, the way that they engage people, is by not laying it all out on the table. One of the issues I have with TV actors is that, you know, in the script, so they, you know, I must be angry, and they're like, Whoa, I'll get you. You know, like, whereas if you look at a good movie actor, you're trying, there's some ambiguity in their performance, and you're trying to read in and try to understand behind their eyes what, it is, what emotion they're going through, and this is why this uh, story works particularly well. So there are 
thousands actually of women on eBay selling their old shoes and they're probably the type of shoes that you could buy at a charity store for a couple of pence but here they invest them with fantasy and people buy into that fantasy so though it's just when you get it it's just a shoe presumably not that I've ever bought them but for the predominantly men who buy these things it's they're buying into the whole fantasy the whole illusion of that and just to take just to stick with eBay there was an experiment that's done and you can look it up it's called significant objects this is just a tile with the number four on it and the original price was a dollar and what this project did was it took everyday objects and it gave them a story so it bought them from eBay and then it relisted them with a story so I don't know what the particular story was on this but it might be um, this was from uh, Colonel such and such uh, in the Raj and this was handed down from his father to his son and this took you know this went on the uh, such and such a voyage and so on and so forth and so from an original price the product was exactly the same the only difference was the listing with a story it sold for $88 and in fact they spent uh, about $128 on junk and sold it for $3,600 and the only difference was the story that wrapped around that product. So this just illustrates really the powerful nature of the storytelling and how we want to invest in these things, how we're drawn to these uh, things. Now a, a key thing about storytelling is that the story is relevant and um, that, it, that it's relevant and that it really um, resonates with people and the way that you can uh, approach this is through your characters so this meerkat character has been one of the most successful uh, characters successful campaigns ever and what's good about a good character is it has flaws it has like a backstory that you can see that there's more to it than uh, you know might be on the screen at that at that time and using characters in advertising and in branding is a very is a very common thing to do the Geico gecko is a is a common character and people see that character as representing the brand and that's how they connect through especially something like insurance which is you know how, what is insurance you know aren't all insurance companies the same they don't have a tangible product that you can feel and so this is a good way to kind of communicate those those values and the old spice man again very successful because people could relate to this type of character the reason that TV shows um, do so well is because of the characters that you could take these characters and they have their own spin-off shows um, and they go from season to season because people invest in the characters because they connect with them they either see their own flaws or they see other people's flaws now an important thing the flip side to stories is is the delivery of the story it's like two sides of the same coin and the delivery of the story is something that we um, get involved in uh, quite a lot because we are creating experiences we're creating um, stories that play out in the real world so we can't assume that somebody's in a particular place and time so if you say you know you create a film you might say is somebody going to watch this at home are they going to watch this um, in the cinema and you might design the movie to be one of those particular types of movies something that people are going to watch as a download or something that people are going to watch in a cinema but when you create an experience uh, when, you, when you create a story that's supposed to play out in the real world we really need to pay attention to what people are actually doing with their real time are they on a commute are they uh, sat in the office are they sat at home is it a weekend and so when we think about experiences and storytelling across multiple platforms we don't think so much about the platform as we do an emotional journey and so for us transmedia storytelling is taking the audience on a journey that goes moment to moment and we think about the emotion every time uh, somebody comes to a particular touch point every time we've got something in the story that we want to convey we're thinking about the emotion now I've got I'm going to finish the talk with a couple of um, uh, quite different examples now is there anybody here that uh, likes sex games um, we've just finished the sex game for the Public Health uh, Institute in Mexico and uh, 
one of the issues that they were trying to address is um, that so many uh, men who have sex with other men uh, don't know if they have HIV or not. And so this, you know, if you don't know if you have HIV, that means you might be having unprotected sex. And obviously they want to control the spread of uh, HIV. So uh, the people that sponsored this project thought that using gamification, using a game, might be a good way to reach out to uh, young men in order to sort of engage with them in this issue. So the way the game plays out is uh, you sort of meet different avatars and you try to chat them up. And if you're successful in the chat up, then you go through to the sex room. <laughs> and uh, when you're in the sex room, you get to get different implements and you can sort of drag them onto other parts of the other chap's body. And uh, if you manage to engage in lots of sex acts uh, without, uh, you know, without sort of heightening your risk of a disease and so on, then you get badges and you get points. And one of the key things that we introduced um, through our technology was the ability to track what you did online in the game with did you actually go to a clinic and get screened. So um, with, the, with the sort of the web app that we had, there was a VIP pass which allowed them to go to the front of the queue if they went into a, into a clinic. And the doctors were able to get a one-time use code, which they gave to the, um, like the patient, I guess. And the patient would put that into the phone and that would verify that they were there at that time. They couldn't share that code because once it was used, that was it. And um, in the game, when people signed up, they were allocated to different groups. So that, and each group had different set of game mechanics. So what this, uh, this experience has just finished and now the client is sort of sifting through the data to see if there's a correlation between the different game mechanics and the propensity to go and get checked in. Now one of the things that I felt was missing on this experience was a really good story because it was really, um, the intention was to really focus on the game. And one of the things that we're discussing um, for the next phase is to introduce a story and the story gives us like a continuity over a number of days and what we can do what I'm showing here is how somewhat like a motivation curve so I've stolen this from someone called BJ Fogg who looks at like people's motivation and when is the right time to call them to action if you want to change someone's behavior um, you should choose your moments so for example like an, an example that he gives would be if someone wants to lose weight, when they're highly motivated, get them to sign up for a personal trainer or get them to join a gym, something that's going to have a big um, impact in the longer term. If they're not very motivated, just get them to do something very simple because if they're not, you know, like, I don't know, eat less, you know, for a particular meal or, you know, take an apple instead of something else, rather than expect them to you know, run a 5K or something because they're not at that point. And what we can do with the technology, as people interact, you can start to infer what point of this sort of motivation curve they're on and then send them different assignments, release different pieces of story that might inspire them to um, take a different course of action. So anyway, so this is something that we're looking at. And what this segues into for me is this sort of the way we see the world. So down in the bottom um, is me in sort of female clothing. I'm in the real world and I'm in a physical world. And often lots of health apps, when they look to change people's behavior, they introduce this idea of a digital coach or a digital, digital buddy. And I see lots of training programs that really focus on the factual and they don't, they don't branch into the emotion. They don't really deal in story enough because they're so keen to get across the learning points and so it is with a lot of these health apps. But when you introduce the story world, it allows me to imagine things, how things might be different. And actually, when we make it participatory, I can play as another me. I can sort of project myself into a future to see what that might look like. 
And what I've shown here, this hole is a portal that takes me from my real everyday world into this imaginary world. And great stories all have this portal. Either you go on a long journey across the sea, so you leave behind what you know and you find this fantastical land. Or you might open a wardrobe and you step from like the mundane into the sort of mystical. Or you might go on a long train journey. So lots of stories use this portal as a way to transition between the two things. And once you're in this new world, then you can decide exactly what the right chemistry is for that. You can decide, and good science fiction stories talk about the issues that, you know, often political or economic issues that we have today, but they tell it in the future and allow us to sort of like, sort of, sort of dismiss some of our prejudices because now this is science fiction. And an area where storytelling works quite well um, could be in scenario planning. So I've met people that spend a fortune on scenario planning. They get lots of experts in a room. They come up with these different possible futures. And then this gets disseminated in a brochure, which goes on people's desk, and then it goes into the bin, and no one ever reads it. So there's all this like, good work that's been done that no one ever engages with. And what you could do with this is tell a participatory story that puts someone in the shoes of somebody living in Future Story 3. And maybe this is a time traveller that's able to hop between these different future stories. And so you can really compare what these scenarios might look like for our, for our business by doing it much more interactive. And so this idea about trying to break away, really, from the normal delivery of the message, I think is really important. And it's illustrated with this final story. So again, uh, so we're working with a big... Um, a big consultancy company right now, um, looking at a serious game for uh, financial compliance. So a big issue with compliance training is that nobody wants to do it. No one wants to go for two hours or two days or a week to listen to a load of boring rules and regulations. But what we can do is we can engage people in a story that fits in with their normal day-to-day -day life. Why not send them a text message when they're on their commute? Why not send them an email when they're in their, when they're in their daily job sat at their desk? This email just comes through the normal email client along with the other emails, except that we're tracking exactly how they respond to that. And we can look across different departments and different, uh, different roles, different uh, teams in that, in that client to see how people are reacting, taking that seriously. And we can make the story uh, about the need for compliance issues, much more um, energising rather than just something boring that people have to, have to do. Now, what I would encourage you to do is go to our website and check this out because this is a storyboard about a health game. And this is somebody that sees the story unfold during their normal day-to-day -day activity. So this guy wakes up, he gets a message telling him that um, so in, in his mind, in the story, he's a colonist on one of Jupiter's moons and um, he gets a text message to say something's gone badly wrong and he needs to make a decision, otherwise uh, there's not going to be any food. And what we've done is we've uh, connected this to biometrics. So the guy um, goes to the bathroom, as he would on uh, every other day, except we're going to analyse his urine and we're going to send him a different notification based on the analysis of that urine. Except instead of telling him that he's not hydrated, we're making it a story issue. We're saying that, you know, your garden's going to die unless you sort of replenish the water. So we're finding a way to actually integrate the thing that we want him to be mindful of with this engaging story. So this is my uh, final slide. So we're looking at this layered approach. So we you know, all our stuff that we do with entertainment experiences is engagement and we can make training very engaging by using great stories with great characters and telling those stories at the right time that fits in with somebody's lifestyle, which fits in with their, with their work. And we can bring in these different sort of uh, training models and different models of memory so that people are reminded at the right time so they don't forget them. So thank you very much for listening.